please join me in welcoming Sarah Langford. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Possibly not the most reverent note to start on, but I did wonder whether it should be less clueless and more legally blonde. Anyway, I am a criminal and family barrister. My name is Sarah Langford, and my practice is on the Western Circuit, which is one of six geographical areas in England and Wales. What that actually means is that unlike the BBC programme Silk, which would have me in red lipstick and very high heels in a black taxi to the Royal Courts of Justice every day, my week looks something like this. My clerks will tell me, all right, miss, on Monday you're going to Reading, on Tuesday you're going to the Isle of Wight, on Wednesday you're going to Bristol, on Thursday you're going to Slough, and on Friday you're going to Bournemouth. But that was not something that I saw represented in any of the legal memoirs or books that I read. Uh, everyone in them, much like the telly programmes that I watched when I was younger, looked and sounded a bit like Rumpel. So when I went on maternity leave to have my two small children, I thought that maybe there was an opportunity to write a different book. A book that explained what our law does, why I think it's important, what our job is, but also what it feels like. I came from a family of farmers. My maternal grandparents farmed in Hampshire. My uncle's still a farmer. Neither of my parents went to university, which was much more common then, of course. Uh, my mum was a primary school teacher. Uh, my dad was a land agent. So the law and those within it seemed very far away from the realm that I knew growing up. Uh, indeed, when I left my school and went to do my A-levels at a local sixth form college, the note that came with me, which I was not supposed to read, uh, our very young new form teacher at accidentally gave us our files, which meant we could. But the opening line that followed me when I was 16 was from my previous headmistress, Sarah Langford will never be a high flyer. I've gone back to that school and given that speech, so it's all all right now, 25 years <laughs> later. What I did do was go to a university that was not the Oxbridge uh, heights that I had read about as being entirely necessary to a career at the law, I went to a university where I read English literature called UWE. It stands for the University of the West of England, but I can tell you that when I was called to the bar in 2005 and told senior barristers that I went to UWE, they thought I'd just made a strange sound. Now, the great thing about a barrister or the training to become a barrister is that terrifyingly early on, you are given your own cases. On the first day of the second six months of your, essentially your training, your pupillage, you have a file. It's your case and you go into court. And I found myself in the throes of people's ordinary but extraordinary lives. In the magistrate's court, in the crown court and in the county court, all life was there. I also found that the training I had had so far was completely unsuitable. All the stuff that I really needed to know, they can't teach you in a textbook, because I realised that when you are a barrister, you are also pretending to be many other jobs as well. You are, for example, a little bit of a social worker. I discovered that when chasing one of my clients across the corridor of the youth court and down the stairs after someone had uttered the C word, custody, and had to persuade him to come back up and face the music. You are also a little bit of a teacher. I very quickly learned that there were many people who I met of all different ages who could not read and write. And I would have to establish that fairly early on so that I was able to read 
the proof that they had given their solicitors to them rather than assume they had done so themselves. You also have to be a little bit of an amateur shrink. And that comes out in all sorts of unhappy ways, including realizing when the person who's sitting in front of you may go home and harm themselves and what you're going to do about it before they get there. And in a strange event, given that when I started I was 23, 24, was that you find yourself a mother. I remember, for example, having to play paper, scissors, stone under the desk at the youth court to keep my very young clients concentrating and in their seats while they waited for the magistrates to come back with their verdict. But as well as the hijinks, and the drama, I learned that while stereotypes sometimes were confirmed, very often, once you had unpicked the black and white piece of paper in front of you and put some human flesh and grey on it, that they fell away. And I thought, if you would indulge me, I might read just a five-minute short reading from the beginning of the book, which I hope tries to uh, encapture what I wanted to do, which is to both explain the law and some of its more complicated twists within the uh, human story that required it. At this chapter, the first one, involves a client, I should say a note on anonymity, uh, I took, although all criminal cases, unless there have been rulings otherwise, are open to the public, you can, and I would highly recommend it, go to your local court and sit in the back and listen to what's going on. Everything said in court, in a criminal court, is a matter of public record. I have, however, changed as much as I was able to change. Uh, names, locations, uh, sometimes but not always genders, as long as I with retained the essence of the case. This chapter is about a very, very, very bad burglar that I represented for nearly eight years. After our first victory, I went on to represent Dominic many times. His crimes were almost always theft, with occasional light violence and plenty of public disorder. He would target cash, alcohol and cigarettes, which he knew he could sell on fast, but which never made him sufficient money to survive on for long. He was not, I soon discovered, a good thief. His crimes were opportunist, usually unplanned, and often committed when he was too drunk to think about the trail of evidence he was leaving behind him like breadcrumbs. Unfailingly, I would read the evidence against him and find myself laughing out loud. Once, climbing backwards out of an office window, he became stuck. Spotted by a passerby, he had to wait, suspended in midair for the police to come and arrest him. Another time, he tore his bag on the way out of a window so that the bottles of alcohol he had just stolen fell and smashed, calling over curious witnesses to investigate the noise. I was involved in only one other trial in which Dom refused to plead guilty. It involved a break-in at a local college and the evidence against him was slim, but the prosecution decided to charge him anyway. They knew that his previous convictions for burglary showed a propensity to commit the crime and that this meant they were admissible by law into the trial. During his evidence, I asked Dom about his past, getting there before the prosecution's cross-examination, hoping to deaden the punch. Dominic, I said, as he stood in the witness box, you are 21 years old and you have 23 previous convictions for burglary. He clasped his hands in front of him, dropping his head. All we could see was his halo of dark, curly hair. Yes, miss, I have. And how did you plead to those burglaries, Dominic? He looked back up and straight at me. Guilty, miss, to every single one of them. So, Dominic, 
Why aren't you pleading guilty to this one? Because, he said, turning to stare beseechingly at the magistrates, all of whom gazed back, I didn't do this one. As the not guilty verdict was read out and Dom skipped away from court with the friends who had been waiting for him, I found myself wondering whether I, like the magistrates, had just been duped. And, if so, whether I was glad that he had got away with it. The more I represented him, the more I began to understand something else. Dominic might be a terrible criminal, but he was not stupid. He would talk me through the evidence. What charges he thought we might persuade the prosecution to drop? Which ones he thought he should plead guilty to? He had a working knowledge of the sentencing guidelines to which all courts abound and which predetermined his fate with a flowchart to his future. Don would tell me which level of the guideline for his offence did or did not apply to him. He would point to details of his case, which meant the judge could go below the sentence starting point. But his special skill was writing beautiful, heartfelt letters to the court, full of pleas and promises of reformation and his commitment to a life beyond crime, where, having never had one, he would hold down a job. He wrote with great charm. His spelling and syntax were better than most of the police statements that had imprisoned him, and more than one judge remarked how articulate they were, even if they rarely worked. He was canny enough to check which judge was sentencing him. Oh, right, he once said, crunching his handwritten letter into a ball. He's had one of these before. Dom had so many court hearings that sometimes barely a week went by without my seeing him. I began to believe that he did not care about getting caught, nor about the consequences. Sometimes, on my way home from court, I would gaze out of the train window as dusk fell and lose myself in a vain fantasy where I took him from his life. I would help him find somewhere to live, get him a job, show him ways to focus his energy and rebellion and character. I would indulge myself in this daydreaming, aware that it could surely never work and that I would surely never try. I thought, naively, that the legal system was about discovering the truth, when of course it is not about discovering the truth. Because what I discovered that although the facts stay the same, there are shades of grey within them. There are different ways of looking at the same set of facts that colours completely your view your moral view, uh, if not your legal one. I found myself feeling that I was a cog in a very large machine that I wasn't entirely sure was working properly. I also began to notice the cycle in human form, so representing the same person, much like the chapter I've just read out, who kept coming back again and again and again their sentences of imprisonment increasing every time. We have a prison population that is nearly at capacity. On my last check, it was 83,800 or thereabouts. But what I had seen in the flesh was our reoffending rates. We are very good at making criminals, and we're very bad at stopping people continue a criminal cycle. Another part of my job, as well as the criminal side, was the family side. Within my family practice, I did a mixture of uh, work. I did some private family work, which was representing parents in disputes about their children. But I also, and predominantly, represented parents whose children were being removed by the state. That, too, I realized I saw the face of the statistic because so often that it began to lose its power when you said it. I would find a client or another party in court becoming pregnant during proceedings 
to have her other child removed. Those of us who work within it accept this cycle. But it's when you finally get the data on it that you realize actually how shocking it is. A uh, report by Professor Broadhurst found that at all of the cases they looked at, 36% of the cases involved women who became pregnant during proceedings. One in four women who have a child removed go on to have another child removed. I also realized, as does I think most people who work within the public sector, whether that's in hospitals or the police or the fire service, because sometimes I would find clients who went from one to the other to the other, is the amount of people who are suffering a scale of mental health problems and how woefully our system handles them. We are in the middle, I think, or at the beginning of addressing the balance, uh, the imbalance of women at the bar, because we know that women want to do it. I expect, and I know because I've spoken to some of them today, that young women do want to go into the law. The entry level has a greater than 50%, I think it's 52 or 53% at entry level of women going in. But my circuit did a report this year that looked at all of the barristers that have left the circuit to practice crime in the last six years. Two thirds were women. Of all the men that left, they all became a judge or retired. Of the women that left, the majority left in the middle of their career. We're not very good at keeping them, but the dialogue about it and how we get better is happening. And the more we talk about it, and the more we can encourage women to go into it with their eyes wide open, but asking for the things that I was told might not be possible, the more likely we are to keep people in it. The other reason I think it's very important to have this dialogue is that many of you possibly may never have stepped foot in a courtroom. It's certainly the experience I have when I talk to people outside the legal world that it feels to them a bit like an umbrella, the law, that it's around us and over our heads just in case we ever need it, in case we get fired, or in case we happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, or even in case we want to take our government to court. We think that it's there, and we see lots of programs which suggests that this is a great uh, output for us, that we uh, encourage other countries to form their legal system like ours. The consequence of that, I think, is that lawyers haven't really talked about what it's really like at the coalface, which is rewarding and demanding. And we're only going to win the sympathy, I think, of people who actually pay our wages, the taxpayers, if we make our job very clear. Because it's a job that requires, I think, compassion. And the way I see it is both a shield over us to protect us from uh, the state, and also, uh, hoping not to stretch my metaphor too far, a building block on which we stand, we think it's always going to be there. And unless we're careful about it, I'm not sure that it will be in its current form for that much longer. The Ministry of Justice budget has been cut 40% over the last 10 years in real terms. If any of you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, this weekend and happen to find yourself being accused of being part of a crime or of a crime, if your household income is over £27,000, you will not get public representation in the magistrates. If your household income is over £37,500, you will not get it in the Crown Court. You will have to pay for your own barrister. If you're acquitted, Without a stain on your character, you leave that courtroom. 
but you also leave it with a very, very large bill because the state won't repay you what you've actually paid. The state will repay you legal aid rates, which are extremely low. So I have a job, a really important job, to try and convince the people who pay my wages that my job is worth paying for, not in terms of innocent until proven guilty, not even in terms of coming in front of a fair tribunal, but in terms of our trust in the law, what we really think about it. Because that is what I think is the real danger. If we imagine getting arrested tomorrow and having no faith that the person that was representing you was going to be good at their job and that the tribunal, the judge that you appear in front of was also no good at their job and that the police hadn't done their job and that the Crown Prosecution Service hadn't done their job. That takes away that umbrella that lies above us. We pride ourselves on our legal system. We know we should be proud because foreigners choose to come here to use it. They do so knowing that the judge before whom they appear cannot be bribed or threatened or bullied into doing anything other than applying the law. That sense of integrity extends throughout the system, not just for those who use it, but among those who work within it and try to preserve its dignity and its efficacy. As a result, our courts dispense justice with a degree of equity that means they're still considered among the fairest in the world. We're in danger of taking this inheritance for granted. Changes in its function and its funding have gouged great chunks out of the high legal principles that we presumed were inviolable. Access to justice for all, no matter what your background or your bank balance. A high quality judiciary, both to enforce the law and to make it a fair, swift, and equal hearing. While the legal system is in need of reform, the cumulative effect of poorly targeted funding cuts over several decades has compromised the criminal law and threatened the principle of good and fair justice, both for victims and defendants. Access to the family and civil courts for those without means is now skeletal. Falling pay and overwhelming workloads have meant that finding new judges is as difficult as keeping the ones we already have, something made no easier by public attacks from those who should know better. The law, and by extension the country, is threatened by an insidious form of corruption that's just as damaging as the more obvious kind. The gradual but irreparable erosion in trust in our legal system. Lawyers say that the law is important even to those who are unlikely to set foot in a courtroom because, as the truism goes, none of us know what life might throw at us. Any of us might become the unexpected victim of a terrible crime or a false accusation. But the law's reach is far wider than this. The decisions made in courts across our country touch our daily lives somehow no matter how far removed we think we might be, or even whether we notice. Our ability to buy and sell, to invest, are made possible by a legal system that's trusted to enforce a contract fairly. From the cost of our insurance to our ability to hold our government and its institutions to account, good and bad decisions by the law reach us all in the end. The law seems removed, because the archaic rituals and language of the court belie the fact that our legal system is a living thing. It deals with the most contemporary of problems, reflecting society back at itself. This is why everyone should have an interest in protecting what we know our justice system can do at its best. The law is human justice, designed and enforced, it will always be imperfect. It makes mistakes. It is slow, sometimes chaotic, sometimes illogical. 
It cracks and at times crumbles, but it remains a pillar upon which our country is founded. Were it to break, the stability of our nation would break too, and we would all be the poorer for it.